Glory to Jesus Christ. Today is our second video on our adult education series on the Divine Liturgy. Last week, our uh, uh, video, uh, we read from St. Germanus on the Divine Liturgy about how the liturgy looked in the 8th century, and what we read last week was uh, the events and chronology of things leading up to the people actually being in the church for the liturgy. Uh, and that's what we'll pick up today from St. Germanus, his description of the liturgy in the 8th century. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, today will lead up to what we refer to as the great entrance in the liturgy. And then just as a little bit of review, uh, on our adult education in person uh, on Wednesday, September 20th, uh, we looked at all the items that are on the altar table uh, in the Orthodox Church and talked about the altar uh, and uh, uh, that it has uh, the relics of a martyr in it when there's a consecration of the altar itself. Uh, so that's what we did last week. This week on September 27th, uh, what we'll be doing is looking at all the other items that are in the altar itself, and specifically the items that are on the table of preparation, uh, which uh, we heard about uh, that in the early church that was in a very separate building. Uh, and now it's a table off to the side of the altar itself. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's pick up from reading about this description of the liturgy in the 8th century. Uh, and again, this is at the point where uh, the people were in the church then. Uh, the word that's used here to describe this part is the enarxis, uh, E-N-A-R-X-I-S, which is the entrance rite. This was a short office of three antiphons used on those days where there was no station, where there was movement from another church to another church. It consisted of three psalms sung antiphonally, each preceded by a diaconal invitation, let us pray to the Lord, and a prayer recited by one of the priests. There was no opening doxology or litany of peace at this point in the service. The patriarch was not yet in church but was vesting in his palace nearby. The faithful gradually entered the church through its many doors, first dropping their, off their offerings at the Scuphilachian, uh, again, which was the, uh, the precursor to what we now have as the table of oblation, that building where the gifts were prepared. So as people were coming to the church, they would drop off the gifts that they were bringing to the liturgy. Then the introit. This was the real beginning of the liturgy, everything prior being merely preparatory. The patriarch, already fully vested, arrived before the royal doors in the narthex and recited the, int the introit prayer during the singing of the third antiphon, which normally consisted of Psalm 94, with the troparian, only begotten son, as its final refrain. The text of the introit prayer is not the same as that of the present entrance prayer, O Lord and Master, our God, who in heaven has established the order and armies of angels and archangels to minister unto your majesty, grant that the holy angels may enter with us, and with us serve and glorify your goodness. Then, proceeded, preceded by the gospel book and the cross, the procession entered the church. Germanus, in chapter 24 of this book, sees this entrance as the coming upon earth of Christ himself. Come, let us worship and fall down before him. Save us, O Son of God. And we proclaim the coming which was revealed to us in the grace of Jesus Christ. The singing of the Trisagion follows immediately, while the patriarch continues in procession around the ambo, up the solea, into the sanctuary, where he venerates the altar, then up to his throne in the back of the apse. We can still observe this last part of the procession at the present-day hierarchical liturgy. And then the liturgy of the word. The patriarch, after entering the church in splendid procession, turns and greets the people, peace to all. Then he sits down and the readings begin. The prokimenon precedes the epistle reading, and the Alleluia psalm comes between the epistle and gospel. Germanus here again stresses the presence of Christ, who comes to us in his word. The readings are proclaimed from the ambo in the center of the church. During the Alleluia psalm, the gospel book, which was placed on the altar table at the introit, is incensed. A sermon follows the gospel. 
And we'll stop there and then we'll pick up on our next video with the great entrance itself. But just hearing this description from the 8th century, we can see uh, the, the real uh, skeleton of what we have as the liturgy already, uh, that the entrance rite consisted of antiphons. Uh, we in the liturgy today sing three of those antiphons uh, in the liturgy. Uh, we sing the hymn, Only Begotten Son, which is one of the ancient hymns of the church. Uh, and the order that was followed, that after those antiphons uh, and the patriarch coming into the church, uh, that there would be uh, uh, the, the litanies done, the let us pray to the Lord from the deacon. We still hear that. Uh, and then that movement of the bishop from the middle of the church into the altar itself as we sing, come let us worship, and then ultimately to the high place, uh, to his throne behind the altar uh, as the readings are read, the epistle and the gospel. So it's a wonderful thing to really think of uh, how historically the liturgy has really remained the same with little details, little different, uh, but really very ancient what we do on a normal basis, on a regular, and, and we should never use the word regular, a divine liturgy, uh, which is the presence of Christ himself, as Germanus tells us, uh, that his word is present with us in the liturgy. Glory to Jesus Christ.